Namo Myorenge Kyo. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to all of those new subscribers who've just joined us recently. And uh, thank you so much to those of you who've been part of this channel and this resource uh, for so much time now, supporting, liking, subscribing to help us propagate the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. Hmm? Um, those of you purchasing ebooks, thank you so much. Several of you recently, it's been a, a great boon putting that into the coffers in order to buy better equipment, do more for you. Um, and of course, uh, the written books. Um, also, using the resource, the threefoldlows.com website, with all of the free uh, information there is on the uh, core study page. Yeah, just link after link after link of key things from from how chanting works to what is karma, so on and so forth. The twelve divisions. I mean, some very su uh, immediate questions that everybody asks uh, in the get go. And then as you dig, more terminology comes up and uh, what is that about? What does that mean? I've tried to answer all of that on threefoldlows.com, at least structurally so that, again, the purpose for this channel, if you're new, uh, there's a video on how to use this resource. There are a thousand videos or more on this channel. So how can you go through them all? Well, there are playlists to help organize that. Where I've t like the Lotus Sutra, gone chapter by chapter, page by page, and read it out loud and intervened in its uh, dialogue to uh, share my insights and uh, my discoveries, not only from my experience of the Lotus Sutra, but my study in general of Buddhism. Yeah, and hopefully that unlocks some doors for you. Right, uh, that's the purpose of the Sangha. Right. And of course, a lot of you uh, and uh, follow and are, make or, are making use of, if I could learn how to speak, <laughs> the uh, podcasts. And those have gotten popular very quickly. So I'm glad that that resource is helpful. Uh, the purpose of all of this is to create greater confidence in our resolve to practice, right? To go from doing something and wondering if it works to doing something knowing that it works and feeling more confident about that all the time. As Nietzsche constantly exhorts us, you gotta have the right attitude because that attitude is what gives you your intent. And without intent, you can't invoke your Buddha-ness, your Gohonzon mind. Hmm? Open, awaken, what is that? And so we're in the midst of the opening of the eye, Gosho, or treatise. And Nichiren is trying to define not only this Gohonzon awakening. Yes, Buddhahood is a, an amazing thing. But how do we penetrate it? How do we open that door? What is that door, that Gohonzon opening look like? How do we get there? And in the last video or two, we notice his discussion has settled into, because it is a treatise, demonstrating through quotations, not only of the sutras, but commentaries on the sutras, by scholars over, over the ages, hmm? about the different levels of teaching and how there is evidence in every level of the teachings that Shakyamuni was talking about the same thing. It's not like he shifted topics. It's like taking a, a, a long journey, like a hike, right? People know about the Appalachian Trail or the, there, there are all over the world, there are special or special memorial uh, pathways that uh, have been up uh, have been maintained through some history that are that have their own significance. We assign significance to everything, but suffice it to say, 
you have a journey that starts at point A and wants to make it to point Z or Z. The reason I didn't say A to B is because what, what a journey consists of is that from the, the, the start, whatever that is designated, there are points along the way that give us reference, right? How far is, have I gone? How far have I yet to go? There are points of interest along the way. By the way, on your way from A to Z, you will pass B, C, D, E, and F. And F may not be so interesting, but G, you really don't want to miss, right? All the while, you're going to Z. But these points along the way are significant. They deepen your appreciation of your experience. You begin to understand more profoundly the nature of your experience because you keep multiplying. Oh, if this, then that must be. Now, if this, 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 wow, this journey is really changing me, opening my mind, nurturing my living, yes? Hopefully, a good hike, yeah? But that's the nature of every endeavor our sentient mind experiences, right? We're not simply a creature, an animal working on basic instinct to feed ourselves, whereas every morning the sun comes up and we go through our routine and we go out and um, we, we hunt food, we gather it and we share it or we eat it and then we take shelter and we wait for the next sunrise and we repeat. But human beings aren't like that because the unique thing about our organism, apparatus, collection of karma, hmm? energy plus action, right? Spawned, emerged, a sentient, an observer, a critical witness, not just a, an observer idly standing by cataloging what we're doing, although we do that a lot. That's samsara. But we're critical. We judge. Right? That's a whole different aspect of witnessing. And so how do we judge? How? Why? What? Why? <laughs> that great trick. Because that implies purpose, doesn't it? Why? Why are we doing this? Why is there this to do? It's kind of a misleading and it leads us into all sorts of phantasms and magical thinking. So I resist the question why because it's, it doesn't really understand what we, what's really useful is the how, right? When I walked between the house and the coon today on my way in, I allowed myself to take in my environment, same environment as it was yesterday, but yet it's different, right? Excuse me, when I get settled on this seat. Allow time for wow. Where I live, there's a lot of moments of wow. We've, we're transitioning from uh, a winter to a summer, we're in spring, and within a day, the amount of green that suddenly appears is, it'll knock you down. Give it a week, and suddenly, trees seem to appear from where they didn't exist before. It was all dead, gray. And now, the world is totally different. My, the, my visibility to other hillsides and so forth, obliterated by leaves, <laughs> just green. 
really in your face. They look bigger. They look closer. I, the fact that they looked closer, not just by their color, but their presence, wow, that's amazing. We need to take more time to be amazed. Just as I am amazed by your practice and your participation. Namo myoho kyo. What are we witnessing? What is so amazing? It's the engine of life. And so we can talk about the engine of life and we can talk about the phenomena from which all life arises. And just like seasons, it arises, it blossoms like the lotus flower. And seemingly, very in very short order of time, it all goes away again, like a big heartbeat. Hmm? Everything in the universe behaves in this manner because this is the process. Instantiation, endurance, dissipation, right? Some very quickly, some over different spans of time. Again, time. This is, it, it's confounding how in language we've created shorthands that are really incorrect. These illusions, right? We make this fo false dichotomy of life and death. We say it all the time, right? It just rolls out. This is life and death. It's all life. Death too is life. Do you see the misnomer? Birth and death are equivalents. Not life and death. Life, it's gone. It's ongoing. It is the process of this universe. This is life with in unfathomable numbers, numbers of moments of birth and death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, all kinds of birth and death, births of leaves, deaths of leaves, births of entire beings, births of thought followed in quick succession by births of successive thoughts. And as thoughts take over previous thoughts, those previous thoughts, well, they've died, haven't they? New thoughts are constantly replacing previous thoughts. This is the perception of time. So we could talk about this all day, and Shakyamuni did for many years, showing people how the mind works, how to perceive what is going on in our perceptive witness of the engine of life, pointing to this place, this situation in the sentient mind that could exist, rest within that very powerful, very clear understanding of life, right? Because before you get to that place of understanding of life, you're constantly chasing understanding and tripping all over yourself and worried that you're losing something and you need more of something and you need less of something. Oh, you've made a mistake. Oh, all that worry and anxiety, Shakyamuni says, you, you, you need to stop spending so much time there. Yes, all of this, but all of this now, 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 in this moment, takes you into the next moment with that mind of awareness, that sentience. Then you're an active participant in the engine of the entire universe you don't have to stress about 
what has happened, you have to focus on what is happening and how are you being in the happening as it moves into the next moment. How will you influence the next moment based on the nurturing love and complete embrace of this moment? How can you make your life a constant celebration rather than a constant trying to go backwards and correct stuff that's already gone? Why are you stressing about that? Look at where you are. Move that forward beautifully, fully, right? Complete and perfect awakening. That's what that means. And Nitrin is walking us through every sutra, every commentary to show this is what Shakyamuni was saying, but it was never complete until in this culminating teaching, the ultimate teaching of the lotus, did he say, okay, enough of the hike, every point of interest along the way, let us all now stand at the summit. Stand at the destination that I've been talking about all this time. Now, how do we take that in? How do we realize it, that we're at the destination? And how can we invoke this destination in every moment of our lives? Moment to moment to moment. How do we keep this mindset of this destination, this all clear field of vision? How do we instantiate it and maintain it? That is the lotus. And yet, these teachers that are all around Nitrin in his day who are following traditions of teachers from hundreds of years before, thousands in some cases, how do they not see this? How are they so admired in the point of interest at G or M or Q that even though they have the Lotus Sutra, the destination, they look at it from M or Q, as though, well, that's something other. It's no different. This is the pinnacle right here. Hello? No, it's not. You haven't gone the route. You're just stuck. Why are you doing that? Right? And you've heard me say it before. Blindingly obvious. Well, now, as we continue the opening of the eyes... Let's hear it in Nitrin's words. I'm sure you'll pick up on it. So we continue. When we compare these sutra passages that I've just quoted with those of the Lotus Sutra that describe it as the greatest among the sutras the Buddha, quote, has preached, now preaches, and will ever preach, end quote, and deal with the six difficult and nine easy acts, the latter stands out like the bright moon beside the stars, or Mount Sumeru need an, um, beside the other eight mountain ranges that surround it. And yet, Cheng Kwan of the Flower Garland School, Tzu En of the Dharma Characteristics School, Chia Xiang of the Three Treatises School, and Kobo of the True Word School, all men who were believed to possess the Buddha Eye, we've talked about the Buddha Eye, haven't we? And the title of this treatise, Opening of the Eye, the Buddha Eye, right? Which I've told you that opening of the eye is the Gohonzon itself. That's what that label, that word is about. Opening the Buddha Eye. Experiencing the Buddha Eye, well, that's Buddhahood. But opening the Buddha Eye is Gohonzon. That's the goal, the objective of our practice is to open the Buddha eye, 
go on zone hmm? all these men were believed to have done it but they did not understand the above passages of the lotus sutra how then could the ordinary scholars of the of the time who appear to be quite blind <laughs> interesting use of the word, be expected to judge the difference between the Lotus Sutra and the other sutras. This difference is as plain as black and white, or Mount Sumeru side by side with a mustard seed. Yet these men go astray. How can it be, right? Blindingly obvious. Why do they miss it? How do they miss it? More to the point, how can they miss it? It certainly implies an intention, right? An agenda. And what do I always say about Buddhism? It's about attitude and intent. So what is their intent? It is hardly surprising, therefore, that they, go, they are also confused by principles that are as elusive as air. Right? These made up rituals and, and mudras, mantras, all these other things that they cloud their minds with. This is why they don't see clearly. Otherwise, they couldn't stand it for themselves. It's so obvious. Hmm? Unless one can perceive the relative profundity of the various writings, one cannot judge the worth of the principles they reveal. I shouldn't say writings there, because Shakyamuni never wrote anything down. It was all oral. So, yes, they're studying from sutras that have been translated and written down, transcribed through many languages and cultures. But what we're studying aren't the writings so much as the teachings, right? So... I would correct that too. I'm constantly critical of the translations because that's where so much misunderstanding comes, especially in uh, the early weeks, months, even years of a student trying to practice Buddhism correctly, fully. These translations, they really get in the way until that the major aha moments of, Oh, I understand what he's saying, even through all the faulty grammatical hoops, linguistics. Hmm? It comes through because it's truth, ultimately. But words can be sources of great stumbling blocks. Dairaku no mao. When it comes to kings, Nietzschean continues, there are great kings and petty kings. And in any matter whatsoever, there are parts and therefore is the whole. We have talked about the simile of the five flavors of milk, but we must understand when this simile is being applied to Buddhist teaching as a whole, and when it is being applied to to one part of those teachings, right? Everything has its relative purity or full expression, right? Just like the hike. Point H has its qualities, and it's entirely appropriate to spend some time experiencing, understanding, inculcating whatever wisdom and experience there is to have at H. But that does not supplant the end goal, the destination. But people get fascinated at their various points. I've never seen anything like K. This K point is just everything to me. It's just a point along the way. Yeah, but okay. Relax. We'll get there. It can't be any better than this. Mm. Just a day ago, this didn't even exist for you. 
please go on. Right? People get stuck. They get comfortable. And the mind does this. The monkeys do this. This is the best banana. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The Six Paramita Sutra teaches that sentient beings can attain it enlightenment, but it refuses to apply this to those without the nature of enlightenment. And of course, it mentions nothing about the doctrine that Shakyamuni Buddha attained enlightenment countless, countless ages in the past. Translation, the Six Paramitas Sutra is about a potential for Buddhahood that some people or some living things cannot reach. They can never attain. This is this unattainable thing. To be like Shakyamuni, an enlightened person. It's a very special, conditional thing. And you may work your entire lifetime to emulate it. Not be it. But you can get pretty darn close. If you have the potential. If it's in you to do it. That's not Buddha's teachings. That's not Shakyamuni's teaching. Shakyamuni's teaching is that we're the ones late to the party, that our sentient mind can perceive the conditions of life that have existed all along. It's not new. It's not something he discovered so much as he realized. Ongoing. Awakening, right? And so this Shakyamuni Buddha attained enlightenment countless ages in the past. That's a reference to the lifespan chapter, right? And that's confusing in the way that it's written. It's not that Shakyamuni Buddha attained enlightenment in time without beginning is that the Buddhahood that Shakyamuni realized has always existed. The potential for realizing the engine of life has been around as long as the engine of life. How could it not have been? There just wasn't a sentient mind to realize it. But now that we're all sentient minds, hello, realize it. Anyone can do this. Oh, but not in the Six Paramita Sutra. Only special people can do it. See? That's the ego getting in the way. That's the, are you qualified? Well, of course you're qualified. You and I know this. But at that time, that wasn't immediately apparent. And that's not Shakyamuni's fault. That's the fault of the transcribers, the memory of people and the value they assign to what they think they know. The Six Paramita Sutra cannot, in fact, even compare with the Nirvana Sutra, Nichiren continues, which compares itself with the ghee among the five flavors, much less with the theoretical and accessional teachings of the Lotus Sutra. And yet the great teacher Kobo of Japan, misled by the above-quoted passage of the Six Paramita Sutra, assigned the Lotus Sutra to the fourth flavor, or that of butter. Oh, it's good, but can't be better than what I see here, because I'm special. And if the so-called gi of the Dharanis, the wonderful and difficult to understand formulas, cannot even match to so-called gi of the Nirvana Sutra, then how could he possibly make such an obvious mistake? Because to Nichiren, it's like, duh! If you really read what you say you've read, you would know. How is it? What in the world is going on in your mind that prevents you from you must see it. You can't be this blind. But people are, right? 
How many times have you looked back on your life and thought, oh, what was I thinking? How could I not see? It's samsara. It's a very powerful drug. Our attachment, right? To ideas, to things, to conditions, to tendencies. Um. And yet, he writes that, quote, the Buddhist teachers of China vied with one another to steal the gi, end quote, calling Tendai and others thieves, when it is they who originated the thinking. And in a boastful vein, he declares, quote, what a pity it is that the worthies of ancient times were not able to taste this gi, end quote. Whew. You see what Nietzsche is doing, right? He's indicating how even these quote unquote masters were so drunk with their own power, their own position, they blinded themselves to the actual teaching, just compounding to them their political power. Hmm? Putting all this aside, Nietzsche says, I will point out the truth for the sake of my followers because others do not choose to have confidence it now, do not choose to have confidence in it now. They are persons who thereby form a reverse relation. What does he mean by that, right? When something, when you're stuck, and something appears to call you out, what's the first thing you do to defend yourself? You demonize it. That's our world today. It's everywhere, right? That's why we're so divided. We can't communicate or discuss or have dialogue about anything. Everything's a position, right? When you're not validating me, therefore you're this or that or that or that or that. That's we. Oh, it's in everything, every day. Vitriol, spitting back and forth. Nobody's really saying anything. They're just calling each other names. Hmm? By tasting a single drop, one can tell the flavor of the great ocean. And by observing a single flower in bloom, one can predict the advent of spring. One does not have to cross the water to far off Sung, China, spend three years traveling to Eagle Peak in India, enter the palace of the Dragon King the way that Nagarjuna did, visit Bodhisattva Maitreya in the Tushita Heaven the way Bodhisattva Asanga did, or be present at the two places and three assemblies when Shakyamuni preached the Lotus Sutra in order to judge the relative merits of the Buddha's lifetime teachings. We don't have to hike this entire A to Z journey in order to look at the map with all of its experiences called out to see clearly that's all well and good, but the destination is the point to even entertain the hike. It's obvious. It is said that snakes can tell seven days in advance when a flood is going to occur. They sense it, right? This is because they are akin to dragons who make the rainfall. So he's showing karmic, cellular, energetic connections that we all have. It's not mystical. He's not saying snakes are like dragons and dragons are mythical. Understanding of dragons is that they clap the thunder and make the lightning and make it rain. It's a brilliant personification. It's a wonderful story. But what it's about is that on a molecular level, an atomic level, a level of energy informations, what goes on in our minds in our bodies, in our brains, no different than what goes on in the universe on a different scale or the weather. 
or in a worm in the ground. The physical aspects of the universe, glorious in their instantiations of every sort of potential, are, after all, made of, formed of, the same things. The building blocks are this momentum of energy in formation. It's just that the snakes can tell rain is coming not because they have some special existence spiritually, mystically, but because they're maybe perhaps closer in their experience to right their mentations. They don't have a sentient mind. Their bodies, their, their energy within them that constructs them is more closely attuned to changes in that very simple matrix that creates the snake. It's much simpler than we, who with a sentient mind, abound in complexity, right? Because we're constantly building that database of identification, that warehouse of self. A snake can't be bothered with all that. It isn't bothered with all that because it doesn't have that facility. So things are super simple for a snake. Hmm? Even in his description of, because like dragons make their, only a human sentient beings could come up with that abstraction. Look how compl complicated that is. You think the snake actually thinks that? No. But understand the point here. Is that there is truly nothing that separates us from the events around us that we're all moment to moment instantiating. <gasps> life, 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 life. And he's going to go on with more examples here. Crows can tell what Lucky or unlucky events are going to take place throughout the course of a year. This is from folklore, right? This is because in the past existences, they were diviners. Birds can better, uh, are better at flying than human beings, no doubt. And I, Nichiren, am better at judging the relative merits of the sutras than Ching Quan of the Flower Garland School, Chia Sang of the Three Treatises School, Tzu En of the Dharma Characteristic Schools, and Kobo of the True Word School. Now, that's not an idle boast. But what he is saying is that I've spent my life studying these teachings. And it seems to be blindingly obvious to me. And I don't have to add a bunch of mysticism, bullshit, magic to it. I'll just read it as written, as translated from Shakyamuni's mouth to whatever cultural hoops and cultural uh, uh, language translations the truth bears out. Through all of my life study, it's very obvious what the journey is and the destination is. So I don't understand how these other people who are supposed scholars, they must choose not to see it. How else could they not see it but by their own choosing, right? Right? That is because I follow the footsteps of the teachers Tendai and Dengyo. If Ching Quan and the others had not accepted the teachings of Tendai and Daniel, how could they have expected to escape the sin of slandering the law? They didn't follow the scholarship. They went off on their own little tangents. Well, if you don't follow all the points of A to Z on the hike to the destination, and you decide at G that you're going to take off on 1, 2, 3, then okay, but don't claim that you know the destination to A to Z. You're, go you're going off somewhere else. You're no longer part of A to Z. This is exactly the criticism of Zen. They've adopted teachings and discourses completely outside the scholarship of Buddhas. So they cannot claim to be Buddhists if they're following something else. They've gone off. 
somewhere else. Right? And that's explicitly the example. I, Nichiren, he continues, am the richest man in all of present-day Japan. But he's not talking about financial wealth, is he? I have dedicated my life to the Lotus Sutra, to the Myoho Renge Kyo, and my name will be handed down in ages to come. Because that's the nature of his resolve. That's the nature of his adamant support, elucidation, proliferation of this ultimate teachings of Shakyamuni. He can't see the future. What he's saying is, I'm adamantine. If one is lord of the great ocean and all the gods of the various rivers will obey him. Of course, that's just the natural order of things, yeah? If one is king of Mount Sumeru, then the gods of the various other mountains cannot help but serve one. If a person fulfills the teaching of the, quote, the six difficult and nine easy acts of the Lotus Sutra, well then, though he may not have read the entire body of sutras, all should follow him. Oh, that's an interesting statement we haven't heard before, right? What he's saying there is something you've heard repeated in various forms, but just to clarify, he's saying, if you really understand the ultimate teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, if you can read, recite, and profligate the Lotus Sutra, the Myoho Renge Kyo, if you're really resolved, if you have a profound attitude of realization, your intent is buddha -ness. then you will, without fail, invoke your Gohonzon mind, your enlightened state, and you will live this life as a Bodhisattva following the Buddha way. Yeah? Even if you haven't read the Hinayana, the Agama Sutras, the Vrimalakirti, the Lankavatara, the Surangama, so on and so forth. Right? He's not saying that that is the only way to practice. Some interpret it to mean that, but that's just them getting in the way again. Nichiren's being very clear here. You don't have to be a lifetime scholar of Buddhism to understand this teaching, because the goal of this teaching was that anyone can invoke Buddhahood, enlightenment, awakening, namo myo renge kyo. That's it. That's the method. That's the, that's the way for you to self-instantiate your clear, aware mind. Be in the present, into the future. Be enlightened now. But, as he's also said, if you're struggling with that, just as he teaches his students, you can reference all these other sutras. They inexorably lead you to this. But if that's what you need to do in order to strengthen your resolve, right, so that you know you're free of doubt, then that's, that's reasonable, that's fine. As long as you understand that ultimately you're going to end up at the destination. Don't just veer off somewhere else. I mean, that, you've totally lost your, your way, your resolve then. That's only your ego could force you to do that. Because you're seeking something that's specific to you. And Buddhahood is the universe. So be special in that regard. Experience the universe in every moment of your life. Right? This is the constant struggle, isn't it? In addition to the three pronouncements of the Buddha in the Treasure Tower chapter, 
of the Lotus Sutra, the Devadatta chapter, contains two enlightening admonitions. An appropriate chapter for admonitions, right? And we'll, we'll finish after this. The first reveals that Devadatta will attain Buddhahood. Oof, and that was a big mic drop, right? He spent years showing that Devadatta had scorched the seeds of his, his enlightenment. And even so, if he just put his mind to it, it's been there all along, so why wouldn't he have access to it, right? David Dada was a man of incorrigible disbelief, of the type called Ichantika, and yet it is predicted that he will be in the future a Buddha called Thus Come One Heavenly King. The 40 volumes of the Nirvana Sutra state that all beings, including the Ichantikas, possess the Buddha nature. But the actual proof of that is found in this chapter of the Lotus Sutra. It's not just conjecture. It's stated explicitly in the Lotus because that's the purpose of the Lotus teaching, yeah? There are countless other persons, such as the monk Sunakshatra, Sunakshatra or King Ajachasatru, who have committed the five cardinal sins and slandered the law, but David Dada is cited as the one example to represent all the countless others. He is the chief offender. He tried to kill Buddha, or Shagimuni Buddha, right? And it is assumed that all lesser offenders will fare as he does. Why wouldn't you? If he can attain enlightenment, how can the others fail to do so, right? Thus it is revealed that all those who commit the five or seven cardinal sins or who slander the law or who are chantikas inherently possessed to taking strong resolve will become Buddhas like the thus come one heavenly king. Poison turns into sweet dew the finest of all flavors, Hendokuyaku, yeah? The second admonition concerns the fact that the dragon king's daughter attained Buddhahood. Yes, a woman. <gasps> when she attained Buddhahood, this does not mean simply that one person did so. It reveals the fact that all women will attain Buddhahood. In the various Hinayana Sutras that were preached before the Lotus Sutra, it is denied that women can ever attain Buddhahood. Right? Misogyny at its best. In the Mahayana Sutras, other than the Lotus Sutra, that's maintained, right? It would appear that women can attain Buddhahood or be reborn in the pure land, but they may do so only after they've changed into some other form as even some translations of the Lotus Sutra point out, that she briefly, in her, in her enlightenment, uh, right there in front of Shakyamuni Buddha, when he said that she would attain Buddhahood, everyone witnessed the dragon king's daughter briefly change into a man, so that she then instantly became a Buddha, enlightened person. Even in the Lotus, the translations maintain this. I would say that that was not what Shakyamuni said, but this is the translator having a really tough time letting go of this idea. Yeah, but first she became a man, even just for an instant. Because, you know, women. <laughs> Talk about the ego of man, yeah? Anyway, Nietzsche's blowing right past that. Some other form, he says. Ooh, how politically astute. It is not the kind of immediate attainment of Buddhahood that is based on the doctrine of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life, though. See, Nietzsche is calling that out, too. He's saying, yeah, translators. Thus, it is an attainment of Buddhahood or rebirth in the pure land in name only and not in reality. The Dragon King's daughter represents, quote, one example that stands for all the rest, end quote. When the Dragon King's daughter attained Buddhahood, it opened up the way to attaining Buddhahood for all women throughout time, throughout the latter ages, yeah? So, two big points. You could kind of see how with the Lotus Sutra, not only was Shakyamuni going, okay, this is how it's done. Shut up with all your crap. This is how you do it. 
Anyone can do it. You can do it now. It's immediate. It's perfect. Stop arguing about who, why, when. Eh, just do it. No one is incapable of doing this. This is available to all who simply choose to awaken to it. Just do it. And he's taking the opportunity to slap some old mythology out of the way. Stop thinking that. This is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. The lotus is unique. Right? Now he's going to talk about Confucianism, preaching, filial piety, and we're going to get into that in the next video. In the meantime, questions? You getting something out of this? I hope so. If nothing else, the fundamental purpose of this resource, these videos, the podcast, the books, the ebooks, all of it. By the way, the ebooks are available on threefoldlows.com. There, you won't see them on the Lulu.com bookstore because I'm I'm kind of keeping that as the print destination for printed books. However, when you click on the link in threefoldlows.com, it's still Lulu's my publisher, so you'll be directed to the Lulu.com store to purchase the ebook. So don't be confused by that. But if you go to the Lulu.com bookstore you may not find it. It's because I didn't publish it there. I published it through the threefoldlowest.com website portal. And when you go to the ebooks page, they're all listed. When you click on it, when you click on one of the links, it will take you to the checkout, the, 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 the uh, yeah, the checkout process through Lulu. They have the files in their database and you'll down, download it from there. They'll handle the transactions and all of that, right? So just, I thought I'd clarify that. I don't think I've said that before, so. In the meantime, keep your practice strong, right? Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's very important to help grow this sangha. I, I don't know how the, the uh, notification bell works in the algorithms. It may help as well. That's up to you to do. Um, in the meantime, just be confident in your practice. Yeah. Keep doing it. Watch your, take care of your health. Thank you for being here, for your support. Patrons, <laughs> you guys are amazing. All of you, if, if you want to, if you bought all the books you need or, or you just want to support our efforts here to make this resource bigger, more inclusive. Use the comments to let me know what's lacking or what you need. You can email me, right? But you can also support us through financial donations, Patreon, patreon.com slash TLK, yeah? Or directly to PayPal. Several of you do, and you guys are amazing. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna let you go. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.